Hello everyone. So this next part of the educational will cover the multidimensional aspect of tractometry and how we can leverage this to extract relevant information. So you're probably familiar with the concept of along track profiling by now, but here's a nice visual recap. So starting from a whole brain tractogram, the first step is to extract or segment multiple bundles of interest. In this case, for example, the corticospinal tract. Next, the idea is to extract a core representative streamline, which typically represents the average shape of the bundle. We then assign each vertex from the original bundle to its closest point along the core, generating these so-called assignment maps, which in this case are color coded for each segment and the number of segments can be user-defined, typically varying between 20 to 100 points. Finally, we map a certain metric onto the bundle, which can then be sampled along each of these sections, generating the so-called track profiles at the end. So the tractometry framework actually first appeared in 2011 in an abstract submitted to the ISMRM, where we can read the following description. The tractometry framework was introduced to combine multi-parametric data along multiple tracks. And in their work and following papers, the authors have relied on track averages here over track profiles. But the key concept is really the multiple metrics. So you can see the tractometry framework as a general concept of mapping and formation over a set of tracks. So in this talk, we will introduce and talk about two key concepts borrowed from data science, but applied to tractometry. So the first one is dimensionality reduction, where one typically projects their high dimensional data onto a low dimensional space, which is more convenient for visualization and interpretation. The second one is anomaly detection, which is the identification of rare observations which deviate significantly from the rest of your data. So let's talk about dimensionality reduction in the context of tractometry. As you've seen on the first slide, one of the strengths of the tractometry approach is to map multiple metrics over a specific bundle. Here again, we have the corticospinal tract with 10 different measures derived from various models. Now, one could then go and analyze each of those independently at the risk of decreasing their statistical power and also losing the potential covariance between these metrics. But what if instead you were to combine those or reduce those 10 metrics into, say, two components which capture the most variance? Well, for that, we have to first talk about how we would structure our data sheet. And it really depends on your hypothesis here or your research questions. But I will give you two examples. So the first one is very similar to what, I've, what is shown on the previous slide, which is basically assigning each diffusion metric to a feature or a column. And each of your subjects will be your sample. Here, the metrics are simply average over a given track, for example or inside the entire white matter. The second example shows a more along track profiling approach where the features are actually your track profiles. For example, here, plotting the FA along the entire corticospinal track from point one to point 100. And again, our subjects are the samples here for the rows. So you can see where I'm heading now. Our data is in a nice format to apply dimensionality reduction, which for the sake of completeness, I will show here some various methods. And again, it is up to you to decide what is best suited for your problem. Some of these approaches are better suited for visualization only, for example, Disney, where some have actually meaning in the interpretation of the resulting components, for example, with PCA. So the next few slides, we will see an example of how PCA can be applied in the concept of tractometry. 
So keep in mind that the goal of dimensionality reduction is to represent a high dimensional space into a low dimensional one. So in this figure, we projected data from 36 typically developing children, where we mapped 10 metrics onto each tract and performed principal component analysis. So basically reducing the 10 metrics onto two components, which explained in this case 80% of the total variance. And what we can see is that each tract falls into a different subspace of this new feature space, which could be interesting to analyze. So this might indicate, for example, that they have different microstructural properties, but it's important to see that each cluster represents the same tract. So all of the subjects cluster together within each tract. And then what you could do, for example, is then take the first component and see how it relates to a given clinical score or your phenotype data. So in this case, uh, these were children aged eight to 18 years old. And we can see that the first component was better at predicting the age of the subjects than any of the individual measures which formed that component. So as you can see here on the left, PC1, had a nice relationship with age, which was stronger than any of the individual metrics which formed that component. And the same here for the corticospinal tract. So this now concludes the section on dimensionality reduction. And we are next going to talk about uh, anomaly detection. So first we have to talk about the case control approach, which is the most typical approach to analyze your data sets. So this makes assumption that there is a boundary that can separate two groups, for example, controls versus disease, and that there is within group homogeneity. And this has been applied also in along track profiling, for example, trying to uh, separate uh, patients with multiple sclerosis from a group of controls along different tracks. And then here you can see where there's a big gap between each profile. Uh, this shows that there is a significant difference between the two groups. But in reality, what we have is often an unclear separation of your groups, um, either in the case where um, the separation is unclear or you have high heterogeneity within one of the groups, or even not enough data to form actually a second group of patients. And this is often the case um, in the literature where you have um, rare diseases, for example. So to address this problem, normative modeling is actually a novel technique which is well equipped to handle this reality. And being able to compare one subject versus a normative population would steer us closer to personalized medicine. So in the context of tractometry, this means that creating a set of normative microstructural features using only healthy controls could help move away from the typical group-wise comparison. So keep in mind the goal here will be to create a set of normative features from healthy controls data only. And there's multiple ways that we can do this. So the concept of normative modeling can be applied using various approaches. One of them uses the z-score, which as a reminder, is the number of standard deviations by which the value of a raw score is above or below the mean value. So here we see an example for a given pathway, again, the corticospinal tract, where one looks at the standard deviation along each point of the tract and see where it falls outside a given threshold, for example, one or two standard deviations. Another example here is with traumatic brain injury. So we have four different tracks and the red profiles um, represent a single subject. So we will refer to this approach as univariate since each tract is tested independently from the others. But not only that, but each point along the tract and also each diffusion metrics, which are mapped onto the tracks. Now, a generalization to the z-score, but for multidimensional analysis is the Mahalanobis distance, which 
can be used in combination with PCA. So one could use that, for example, to detect outliers, as is done on the left here, um, by looking at how far a specific point falls outside of the range, or to, to train a classifier to actually cluster controls from data in the new latent space. So just to quickly recap what we've seen so far, we have the univariate z-score, which can be used to detect outliers. We have the generalization in multidimensional space, which is the Mahalnobis distance. But we could also use deep learning, which basically, so we can perform outlier detection using a deep normative model. I'm gonna walk you through the slide here. So here the goal was to detect outliers using an unsupervised way, since having enough data to do supervised learning can be a real challenge in neuroimaging. As we've said before, sometimes you have really rare diseases which can be hard to assemble into a large group. So the idea here is to train the autoencoder to learn healthy microstructural features using only normal healthy control. So an autoencoder is a pretty simple network which is made of two parts, the encoder on the left and the decoder on the right. And the goal here is to encode its input into a low dimensional space and then tries to reconstruct it at the end. The features or the X vector here are the columns which we've covered a couple of minutes ago. These are your microstructural features like your track profiles or your track averages of different metrics and tracks. Now to learn how to reconstruct the features, autoencoders try to minimize the reconstruction error or the, if you want the distance between the input and the output. Here in this case would be the distance between x and x hat, which is behind my camera right now. Once it is trained, one can then expose a new subject which is unseen to the network and see how far it falls from the population norm. So if the subject comes from the same healthy representation or population as, as the network was trained on, then the assumption would be that the, the encoder can easily perform its task of coding and decoding. But if that subject has an anomaly somewhere in its features, the network will have a hard time to represent this and this will cause a high reconstruction error at the end, so the distance between the input and the output. And then by inspecting the features of where this error occurred, one could then relate this to a location in the brain, for example. So here is an example of a typical healthy control subject, where you can see that the set of features are all concatenated together so each 20 point represents a track profile. So for example, this would be the arcuate fasciculus left, right, and then for example, the corpus callosum, corticospinal tract, etc. And then the solid line in orange represents the input, so the set of features or X if you want. And the purple dashed line behind or overlapping is the reconstruction from the network, so X hat. And then what you can see is that the anomaly, there's no anomalies here, basically. Uh, the two profiles, they lined up pretty well. On average, the error, so the mean absolute error is of 0.10 for this metric. On top is a subject with copy number variant. And then you can see multiple sections highlighted by the network as being anomalous, where the distance between the input and the output was greater than a certain uh, value. And then these sections relate to specific tracks or locations in the brain, and you could use um, this to then interpret the results. So I will go through a couple of examples on how you could use this framework, and hopefully this will give you ideas on how to apply it to your own data set. So using the same um, cohort as the last slide, so um, this can be used for classification scenario. Uh, so in this case, um, 
we have, as you can see, a big class imbalance. So we have a lot of healthy controls, but not so many children with uh, the copy number variant. This is a rare disease uh, or, or rare condition. So we compared basically the three approaches which we have uh, presented. So the Z-score, the PCA, and the autoencoder at being able to uh, distinguish between those. And you can see that the autoencoder and the PCA actually perform quite similarly, but um, quite a big gap over the Z-score. So what you could do then is each of the anomaly scores from the healthy controls um, are presented here. And then these are the eight um, subjects with CNV, which have a higher anomaly score than the healthy controls. And if you look at where these uh, anomalies were on the track profiles, in this case, we could see that in six uh, subjects, anomalies were in the ILF, so the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So this maybe could tell you something about um, the specific condition, for example. So these are consistent locations, but it is not required by the network uh, to find anomalies. Basically, each subject could have anomalies everywhere, um, and these could still be picked up. So another application is for single subject anomaly detection. So in this case, um, this was a patient with epilepsy, uh, which was compared to uh, 75 healthy controls. And we know here where the lesion was. So with the help of a clinician, we have a focal cortical dysplasia here and a T2 image. And what we did is we selected five bundles which passed in the vicinity of the lesion to see if the network would be able to flag uh, an anomaly in there. And if we look at the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, um, we have 20 points, so zero at the beginning and 20 at the end. This creates the track profile and it represents um, this section of the graph here, so from 20 to 40. And if you look at where the lesion is on this mid uh, coronal plane, you can see that it passes through the points 5 to 10. And in the network, you can see that these sections were highlighted as anomalous by the autoencoder. And the same for other sections of different bundles. But if you look at the traditional Z-score, in red is the subject compared to the 75 healthy controls. And you can see that it falls within the standard deviation uh, of the group. So this would not have been picked up by a traditional univariate approach. This third scenario uh, is again a classification problem. But in this case, it is using uh, data from uh, schizophrenia patients. So trying to classify healthy controls from schizophrenia, you can see that the Z-score and the PCA actually perform worse than the random uh, pick, basically. Uh, and then the autoencoder uh, was a bit better. And you can see here on the right, the same kind of graph. So the anomaly scores uh, for the schizophrenia, which were computed in relation with uh, the healthy controls. And what you could do, as an example, is to link these anomaly scores with um, a clinical assessment. For example, the Hopkins anxiety score. Uh, so these are examples, probably not the best correlation graph that you've seen, but it gives you an idea of how you could apply uh, this framework. And keep in mind here that this is a challenging task at hand. Um, because doing even a supervised uh, approach using a support vector machine, give same or similar accuracy as the autoencoder, which was unsupervised. So with this, we provide a visual analytics framework, which runs interactively in the browser, um, where users can interactively see the features, which are anomalous and generate a report and input your uh, data as a simple CSV file. Um, so I invite you to go and have a look and test it out. And finally, um, to generate these track profiles, I thought I would compile a list of tools which exist and you could use, um, basically pick the one you prefer. Uh, so you could look at uh, automated fiber quantification, DiPi, SilPi, TrackSeg, Tracula, and ExploreDTI.
So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions or email, uh, feel free to uh, reach out. Feel free to uh, reach out.